kind of cast vision here. People of the promise, kingdom divided. I am praying they come up with an, an, some sort of uh, shortened version of that title because I don't want to say it 75 times. People of the PPKD or something, maybe. But anyways, that is our study for next year. Essentially, stuff we haven't studied in like 20 years, you guys, and stuff that's brand new, Lamentations and Jeremiah, the list is very long of all the books we're studying. You can find that on the website, but it's pretty exciting, all the new things. So if we are ready, let's roll the footage. You're so close. Okay, so I'm going to do the rest of my announcement, and you tell me when you're ready. That'd be great. Okay, so next week, class is not over. This is not the finale. Next week is sharing night, and I know it's an easy one to want to blow off, but don't. Come next week. Come, come, come. We're going to begin in your discussion group, so it's your last fellowship with your group so you can share there you can share in here you don't have to share it all you can just listen and hear god's faithfulness in your group members and in your class members go straight to your rooms and or your zoom links um as you normally do and then we'll meet in here to share just some of the incredible ways that god's revealed himself to us as a class um also remember to register yourself and or your students for the upcoming BSF year by going through mybsf.org this week. If you've had trouble with those links or any of those comments or anything like that, talk to the admin. Um, but we, there's some glitches, like people are gonna be removed from the database in June if they're like the students. So we don't want that to happen. So please talk to an admin and or the children's supervisor if you want to bring an additional student next year. So if you like bring your neighbor or a grandchild and you're not the registering or you're not the parent, talk to one of those people to get that figured out, okay? Because we don't wanna lose those students in our database. Okay. Testament. Um, this incredible account of the life of our savior, Jesus Christ, has more than 100 Old Testament allusions and quotations from books like Isaiah, Micah, Hosea, and Joel. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus was constantly quoting and alluding to and reaffirming the authority of the Old Testament. Even if Jesus had never said a word about the Old Testament, his very existence affirmed the importance of these books to the Christian faith because his birth, life, death, and resurrection fulfilled more than 300 Old Testament prophecies. In our next study, BSF will continue deepening our understanding of Jesus by exploring 15 of the Old Testament books he held so dear. We will study books like Jonah, Amos, Jeremiah, and Lamentations in community to discover what they originally meant to the Jewish people, how they connect to the life of Jesus, and what all of that means to us living today in the 21st century. Jesus loves the Old Testament, and we believe you will too. We hope and pray you will walk through these life-changing books together with us here at Bible Study Fellowship. Oops. Have you known? There's more. Okay. Nope. It's all done. Great. We um, are so excited for next year and hope you will join us in that study. Um, it's kind of fun coming off of Matthew where we've seen the fulfillment of a lot of those prophecies and then to go backwards and see where they originated. Let's pray. Father God, how we love you. How we long to bring glory to your name. You graciously suffered and died so that we might have life both here on earth and eternally with you. We love you. We pray over our last group discussions tonight. Would you just grow and sanctify us as we study your word? Would you keep us close to you as we prepare to break for the summer? Give us new ways to meditate on your goodness and faithfulness. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Victory. What does that word mean to you? Does it mean the completion of a task or an activity? the finishing of a race or a school year, the conquering of an opponent or an enemy, 
the winning of a game, the hanging on till graduation, the existence of a weed-free garden. Victory this last week for me has meant surviving surgery, battling through pain and the side effects from that surgery and the medicine from that side effects, and trying to keep the wheels from falling off everything else in the process. We know that one day each one of us will succumb to death, but we know that we live victoriously with our Father in heaven forever. One Saturday morning when I was in high school, my mom left the house to attend a funeral. She came home from that service a few hours later in an unusually joyous mood, which I thought was strange coming back from a funeral. She could not stop talking about the testimony of this woman's life, about how everything in that service had glorified God and amplified the gospel message. They sang one of my mom's favorite songs, a song that I didn't know yet, but that she made my sister and I learn every word to right then and there. She made us promise that we would sing victory in Jesus at her funeral too. And now it's on my list. Every minute, every hour, every word, every action of our lives should bring glory to God because every single victory is ultimately his. Victory in Jesus, my savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. We'll sing it next week too. Last week, we were reminded that Jesus was both the sin offering and the scapegoat that God had prepared to bear the sin of those who put their trust in him. He willingly experienced the full force of God's wrath against mankind's sin in obedience to the Father because of his love for the sinners that he came to rescue. And Jesus put aside the glory of his deity to bear sin's curse. Because he did, believers can now be clothed with his victorious robes of righteousness. We began the study of Matthew 29 weeks ago with the unassuming record of Jesus' birth and genealogy. And we complete our study today with the dramatic account of Jesus' victorious resurrection from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is a singular event like none other in history, and it compels a response. You can either accept the reality of the risen Christ or you will reject it. There is no middle ground. We'll study our passage in three short divisions tonight. Our first division is He is Risen from Matthew 28, 1 through 10. Our second division is you are to say from Matthew 28, 11 through 15. And our third division is go and make from Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Our first division, he's risen details, Jesus' miraculous resurrection, which demonstrated God's power in delivering humanity from their slavery to sin and death. Matthew provides us with not only an account of the resurrection story, but a statement of its fact. Each of the four gospels tells of the empty tomb, the early morning discovery made by the women, their encounter with an angel of the Lord, and the appearance of Jesus after three days. Jesus repeatedly had told his disciples what would transpire, but the resurrection still came as a great surprise to them. Verse one says, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. The earthquake suggested great divine intervention. An angel of the Lord had come down from heaven to roll the stone away from Jesus' tomb, not to let him out, but to let us in. His appearance was like lightning, his clothes white as snow, and this caused the guards to be so afraid that they shook becoming catatonic. Those assigned to guard the corpse became like one themselves. The one who was dead was now alive. Well, the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, he is risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. The angel consoled the women and commanded them not to fear. Their crucified Christ was alive. The angel knew that the women would have been startled and confused by the events of the previous couple of days, so he invited them into the tomb to see for themselves. The women knew about Joseph's burial of Jesus, but they would have also known about the Pharisees' plan to secure and guard the tomb. 
What did they expect to find? Were they frightened by the guard's presence? Did the earthquake and the appearance of the angel deter them or embolden them? I imagine that while they are most certainly overcome by fear, they were also greatly encouraged by this compassionate messenger of the Lord. He provided comfort and assurance in the most harrowing of situations, but then immediately charged them with an important task. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. I know when I am grieving or anxious or emotionally charged for any reason, I like to have a task. I want someone to give me instructions on how I can serve or clean or prepare something, anything. The absolute worst thing that you can tell a Martha like me during an emotional or a difficult situation is just sit down right here and stop working so hard. I manage stress of any kind, good or bad, by doing things. If I keep my mind and my body and my hands busy, I can buy my mind a little time to process the emotions of the circumstance. The angel told the women to give two messages to the disciples. Jesus was alive. Meet him in Galilee. God the Father brought Jesus to life because he had paid the penalty that sin had imposed. Jesus' resurrection made way for the gift of salvation. In other words, Jesus' sacrificial death and victorious resurrection provide the foundation for our biblical faith and eternal salvation. Every beautiful truth of the Christian faith rests on the foundation of this one essential doctrine. It is historical fact that Jesus physically died and that his physical body was raised to life. This fact was verified by his friends, strangers, and even enemies. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. Fearful but ecstatic, the women left this place of sorrow, this terror of death, because they had seen and they believed. These women had been the last to linger at the foot of the cross, and they'd been the first to approach the tomb to honor the body of Jesus. And now they'd be the first to see the risen Lord. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said, then came to them, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. Immediately, the women grasp physically his feet. They grasp the feet of Jesus in worship. Matthew gives us such a clear, detailed description. This resurrection was physical. It was real. Jesus is so beautifully unexpected here, so incredibly kind and loving. The savior of the universe, risen from the dead, appears out of nowhere and simply says, hey, ladies, they fell at his feet in praise. Don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Can you imagine how reassuring these words would have been to the disciples? Our relationship is not broken. The plan has not changed. I am still sovereign. I will meet you in that place. Your hope is certain. Our risen Savior calls all people to a hope that overcomes fear. Every single person is invited to believe. This brings us to our first principle. All people are invited to believe in the risen Christ. All people are invited to believe in the risen Christ. The physical facts verifying Jesus' resurrection build our faith. Why is the evidence of Jesus' resurrection so important? Why did God so carefully record these details? If Jesus were not raised from the dead, our faith would be in vain. We would have no hope. How has this passage raised your awareness of the importance of the physical reality of Jesus' resurrection? Do you believe that Jesus is always with you? Do you believe that the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of Christ, lives within you? The presence of Jesus changes everything, our perspective, our outlook, our outcome. This world is not all there is. This life and its purpose is not about us. Everything in this world and the next points to Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. The women's response of acceptance and belief should inspire our faith. He has risen just as he said. 
Our second division is You Are to Say from Matthew 28, 11 through 15, where Jesus' enemies bribed the tombs guards and spread lies about his resurrection. Miraculous divine intervention often has no impact on a person's choice to believe or reject Jesus' victorious resurrection. The guards witnessed the angel of the Lord rolling away the stone and heard his firsthand testimony just as the women had. But they did not choose to believe. They chose to support the lies and the cover-up story of the Pharisees. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. The women went to the disciples with a message of profound delight. But the guards went to the Jewish leadership with confusion and shock. The guards reported to the chief priests, not the ruling Roman government, which meant that they believed their authority was the Sanhedrin and not Pilate. If they'd truly been under Roman authority and had lost a prisoner, literally lost him, they would have paid for it with their lives. The Jewish leaders bribed the guards to lie about what had occurred, and they promised the soldiers that they would deal with Pilate should their failure to guard the body come to his attention. This is further evidence of Pilate's moral weakness and his great fear of displeasing the Sanhedrin. These verses demonstrate clear proof of the resurrection. The leadership invented a lie to handle the rumors. You are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. This is the second time that the Jewish leadership has paid money to protect their own interests. It's insanely ironic that they went to such great, extraordinary measures to ensure that Jesus' body was not stolen, yet that's precisely what they claim to have happened. Their story was that the frightened, scattered, ragtag band of fishermen and zealots had now become stealthy, secret agents, stealing bodies under the cover of night. Their cover-up was a sign that they believed the guards' stories. The religious leaders simply did not want to admit that they believed. They did not want to accept that Jesus was their promised Messiah. The religious leadership saw Pilate as weak, gullible to power, a puppet easily manipulated with just a bit of pressure. If the guards had been sleeping, how would they have known what had actually happened to the body? The soldiers made off like bandits, no pen intended. They escaped the consequences of their failed duty and they earned a pocket full of extra money. Their propaganda campaign was a success. Their story was widely circulated among the Jews. Jesus was resurrected in a glorified body that will never again be touched by death. His resurrection paved the way for the eternal life of believers who will die physically, but live eternally with Christ. Jesus' resurrection proves that believers are raised from spiritual death to live a new life. The resurrection life that Jesus secured for believers empowers them to live for God and to share the gospel with others during their time on earth. We must respond to our risen Christ. Will you choose to accept or reject Jesus' victory over death? This brings us to our second principle. Many people will refuse to believe in the risen Christ. Many people will refuse to believe in the risen Christ. The spiritual truths that accompany Jesus' resurrection transform our lives. The Son of God was not a victim of death. Sin did not win. God claimed his victory when Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus' resurrection definitively declared that we are set free from our slavery to sin and death. We've been set free to obey God and to live with him forever. How has this passage taken you beyond the facts and helped you to contemplate the victory of Jesus' amazing resurrection. What's keeping you from choosing to believe in the resurrection of Christ? Choose life. Choose Jesus today. Re-energize your faith with the truths of his amazing resurrection. Our third division is go and make 
from Matthew 28, 16 through 20, where Jesus commissions his followers to go and make disciples in his name. The reality of the risen Christ cannot be denied. His resurrection was victorious. And now Jesus instructs us how to respond to that resurrection. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. This meeting had been planned. It was not happenstance or accident. Jesus had told them where to go, and they had obeyed. And though some simply could not believe what they were seeing, the disciples' overall initial response to the risen Lord was worship. Jesus' presence should compel us to worship. But I think it's kind of beautiful here that the worship of the disciples is mixed together with a little doubt. Haven't you ever stood in the presence of the Lord singing praises at the top of your lungs, bringing glory to his name, and yet been simultaneously unsure of where your next paycheck was going to come from? Been fearful of what would be next for your broken relationship? Been anxious about a treatment or a diagnosis? Begged for a miracle or a reprieve or a glimmer of hope? I faced each one of those exact doubts head on this very year. Jesus understands our fears, our doubts, and our insecurities. But he longs for us to bring them to the foot of the cross. He will not always give us all the information that we think we need, but he will give us our daily bread. He will always provide us with enough physical, emotional, and spiritual sustenance, enough manna for this day. We can doubt the outcome of a situation and yet still have faith that Jesus will work everything out for our good and for his glory. Belief in our risen Christ is always cause for worship. The last three verses of Matthew 28 are known as the Great Commission. Jesus promised his disciples a source of power and authority. He gave them a command. He instructed them how to carry out that command, and he promised them his presence. Jesus' followers and each one of us who claim to be believers today are commissioned in his power, commissioned to his program, and commissioned with his presence. Jesus stressed the word all four times in his commission, emphasizing the complete depth and breadth of his words. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. God the Father has enthroned Jesus with all majesty and power to rule as the resurrected triumphant Lord and King of the universe. Jesus now rules over all heaven and earth. His universal authority was achieved through his obedience and suffering, and it will be backed up, and it backs up the commission he's about to deliver. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus commands us to intentionally go out and multiply his kingdom by making more disciples of Christ. Pour into the lives of others, encourage their spiritual growth, walk alongside them in their journey of sanctification. We accomplish the making of disciples, the development of true followers of Christ by going, baptizing, and teaching. Discipleship is about carrying the message of Jesus to all people of all nations. Go to your schools, your neighborhoods, your workplaces, your families, your communities. Share the gospel of Christ in all your going. The emphasis on baptism here is the inward reality of spiritual baptism, the internal transformation that occurs when we begin a new life in Christ. Water baptism may often follow as the outward affirmation of that inward reality. Disciples thrive and are encouraged as part of a community of faith where teaching occurs. Through teaching, disciples are brought to maturity. God's truth is so wide and so vast that we will never be able to wrap our arms completely around it. We will never know the depths of the wisdom of God. Jesus concludes his great commission with beautiful assurance. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He's reassuring his followers that there is much more to this story, to their story. 
The promise of Jesus' presence was not just for the 11 or even for the 500. It was for the church, the bride of Christ, through the centuries until the end of time and history. Matthew began Christ's ministry with the insight that light had come to the Galilee of the Gentiles. And it ends with Jesus' command to take his message out to the Gentiles, to all nations. Jesus Christ, our Emmanuel, whose name means God with us, promised in his final moments on earth that he is with us. Jesus will be with us forever. God came to us and he will be with us to the ends. When we struggle to believe that Jesus Christ died, was buried and was raised to life, we will remain stuck in our sin, shackled by death. We will have no true hope beyond the certain hour of the death that surely awaits us. But when we do hope, believe that Jesus has died on our behalf and was resurrected in victory, we have hope. Jesus conquered our worst enemy. We are raised and empowered to live a transformed life now. We can rejoice as we anticipate the day when we will be resurrected in a glorified body and will live forever with our risen Savior. The risen Christ has empowered us to spread the good news. This brings us to our third principle. The risen Christ empowers his disciples to spread the good news. The risen Christ empowers his disciples to spread the good news. Jesus' resurrection power is available to you right now. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead abides within every child of God. Jesus will make the dead places within you come alive through his resurrection power. He awakens our hearts to love God, and he provides us with the strength that we need to seek, obey, and please him too. What might be clouding your focus of the reality of Jesus' presence? What could be blocking your ability to worship? Every one of us is on a collision course with death, but we know as believers that we will never be defeated by it. We have hope beyond the grave. Jesus' death brought suffering, but it accomplished our salvation. Jesus' resurrection resounds as a glorious proclamation of God's victory. Sin did not get the last word. Jesus has risen from the grave. Celebrate this victory today. Let's pray. God in heaven, we praise you for the victory that you have brought us over sin and death. We just stand in awe at how you've delivered us and given us this victory. Help us to boldly proclaim the gospel with every thought, word, action. Never let us be ashamed of the hope that we have in you. We thank you, Lord, for another glorious year of studying your word. How we praise you for the study of Matthew. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. See you next week.